Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to say good to see everyone. Hopefully you're seeing us <laughs> up here. And uh, we are really thankful. Hey, f- right, right off the bat, I'm going to say shout out to uh, Dave and Bob in our sound room to make this possible. So thank you guys. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we're in a we're in a difficult time, and and yet remembering Palm Sunday is an important part of our faith. And before Linda uh, shares a a comment, I just want to um, say that we're going to do communion today. If you had received the letter that I sent out uh, this during this week, and if you're not prepared at this moment, uh, go ahead and find a a beverage and uh, a piece of bread so that you at home can participate uh, as we, uh, as I share communion comments. Yes, good morning, everyone. I hope that this Palm Sunday in 2020 finds you saying in your heart, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes Mm -hmm. in the name of the Lord. Amen. But truthfully, sometimes you might find yourself saying, like me, how long, O Lord? This has been a a difficult season for us all, and yet the Lord has remained faithful in his steadfast love to all of us. The first thing Jesus did after he got down the Mount of Olives, and they all were rejoicing with their palms, and he went into the temple, and the first thing he said was this, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And that's what I want to encourage you with today, to keep praying, to not give up, to remain steadfast, to have patience, to establish your heart in the Lord. Cast all your anxiety to him because he cares for you. To take charge of your mind, not let it run rampant with uh, imaginations and fear. but to trust in the Lord, to take every thought captive to him. That's right. And so what I miss most is the Sunday morning prayer at 9. And so that is deeply being missed as well as all of the fellowship with you here at Sierra Reach. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. Also, as you're preparing for communion, I want to give you uh, just a few announcements. <clears throat> Very important, this Sunday, excuse me, this Friday, uh, Good Friday, we're having a, a live stream uh, service. Five churches have come together, um, Gold Country Church, Sierra Grace, Compass Church, which was formerly Combi Bible Church, First Assembly of God, and Sierra Reach. And the way you can view this is go to our website, and there'll be a link on our homepage for you to uh, click, and you'll be able to see that. That's at 6.30 this Friday night. Also, uh, I want to mention that uh, our faithful servants on uh, Thursday, I believe we served uh, 87 or 88 families through our drive through very grateful families uh, to receive help. And lastly, I want to say our youth have been uh, connecting um, with Zoom, uh, that application. So if uh, you're not a part of that dialogue, any of you um, uh, teenagers, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, contact Paul Gullion, the youth pastor, and he'll set you up. He'll get you connected. So hopefully uh, you've uh, had a moment to get some uh, elements for our time of communion. As you'll see in the portion of scripture that 
uh, I will look at today. Uh, it's in Luke chapter 19, beginning at verse 37. I want us for our communion comments, our communion thoughts, to think about a dual track. Two things are happening at once. As you'll see, the people are rejoicing. The people are saying, Hosanna, and we'll talk about that in the sermon. But Jesus, as he's approaching Jerusalem, wept over the city. You know, uh, when uh, children are excited about something, all you parents know, and all they can think about is the joy of whatever activity or event, and yet the parents are aware of the cost. <laughs> Maybe they're aware of what's involved. And there's two tracks going on, a sober uh, mindset by the parent and a joyful, in-the-moment mindset by the children. Well, that's what went on here during this time of uh, Jesus approaching Jerusalem. Palm Sunday. I'm going to give you some details during the sermon that will help you see how sober and the reason that Jesus wept as he approached the city. But there's so much happening in our world today, and I know uh, we're all uh, inundated with a lot of information, and thankfully uh, that's so. But we want to really be thankful for all our medical people want to really be thankful for our first responders, all our emergency uh, resource people. Uh, grateful for our government leaders who are trying to do the best they can. But I know that there is pressure at home because we're out of our normal sequence of things. Maybe there's financial pressure, relational pressure, um, the first week or so may have been really fun having uh, the kids home. Now you've run out of things to do. Now we all have to stay in. We need to be wearing masks. I, I didn't wear my mask now so that you could see my lips moving. But one thing we need to always remember, our Savior, our Lord, Jesus Christ, is on the throne. He rules. Our God reigns. And as Paul said in Romans 8, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. What Jesus did as he set his face like a flint to go to Jerusalem, he knew what was ahead. Uh, a few understood Mary, uh, the, uh, sis the sister of Martha and uh, Lazarus, she knew because she anointed Jesus' feet and, and head, anointed him, and was preparing for his burial, basically, before all this even happened. She was a woman of faith. But... Many did not understand. We need to realize that neither life nor death, nor viruses, nor persecutions, nor things present, nor things to come will ever separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. When Jesus went to the cross, he went there for us to fulfill God's love of being a propitiation of being the, the fulfillment of God's love to redeem us from our sins. Linda, why don't you uh, bring up the elements? We're very grateful that the Lord has given us this symbol because the bread symbolizes his body that was broken for us. He knew what he was facing. In the book of Hebrews, it says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross because he knew what was on the other side. Two things, 
salvation for anyone who would believe and receive, and also reunion with his Father. And so we remember the Lord Jesus by taking the, the bread that symbolizes his body. We also remember that he shed his blood. Right from the Garden of Eden, we see that without the shedding of blood, there was no forgiveness of sin. But that was kind of veiled. And then through the law, we understand that very thing, that the shedding of blood washes away the sin. And then Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, shed his blood for us, that cleansing blood, that new covenant relationship with God. And so we're grateful that we can remember him by taking and receiving the drink together. Let me just pray. Father, we do thank you for these moments they're true moments. Our life is in you. You said, Lord, do this in remembrance of me. That's what we're doing, in remembrance of you. We're so grateful for your love. We're so grateful that you've called us into your family. We're grateful that we can participate together through this medium so, Lord, um, be glorified right now in our families, at home, taking communion together, a new normal, but it's beautiful where families and individuals can say yes to you and remember your goodness. So, Lord, we love you. And we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I wish I could ask for some testimonies right now. <laughs> You'll just have to save them up for us. And then when we're back together. Wouldn't it be nice if the rain could just wash away the coronavirus? That'd be great. Uh, however, I guess it's a people-to-people -people kind of problem. And uh, so let's be wise in uh, our time as we continue to wait. So if you'd like to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 19, verse 37, we'll begin there. It's been a little over three years now that John the baptizer announced, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And those spiritual truths spoken by that prophet of God, John, as well as our inspired writers, were coming to fruition at this point. This is going to be Jesus' last Passover week. We call it the Passion Week as he comes in. And no doubt, the disciples, as you'll, uh, you'll see here, they probably are marveling at the display of joyful singing and worship, honoring Jesus as he approached Jerusalem. And as I mentioned in the communion comments right at the beginning, this dual track, the people are rejoicing and Jesus is weeping. What a contrast. Let's begin at verse 37. And as he was now approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, and I just want to say if you've ever been um, to Israel, Linda and I were there, and when you're up on the Mount of Olives and looking across the valley, uh, you see the picture you always see, the Dome of the Rock, you know, the Temple Mount. But to get to Jerusalem, you have to go down and then cross the valley, and then come up. That's why they say, let's go up to Jerusalem. 
and we walked that walk, and that was uh, that was inspirational. You know, for Linda and me, uh, we kind of being there. It was like feeling like you were at home, knowing that this is where Jesus walked, and we were walking that walk. Again, and now as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. What they were saying was, Baruch Habab Bashem Adonai. Baruch Habab Bashem Adonai. In Matthew 21, verse 9, they were also saying, Hosanna, Hosanna to God in the highest. Hosanna, as we know, or if you don't know, it means save now. Save us. Save now. And so that little bit uh, is very important to bring in from Matthew. Luke uh, left that portion out. But they said, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. They're singing this. They, are also, they also said, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. What, what does that sound like? That sounds like what they, they were echoing what the uh, angels were saying and singing that morning that Jesus was born, that evening, uh, to the shepherds. So it's interesting that they would actually bring that in. Of course, the Israelites there rejoicing are saying Hosanna, they're not thinking spiritually, most likely. They're thinking, save us now from the Romans, from the captivity. Now, in these two uh, verses here, 37 and 38, we see something. Something is uh, happening, of course. There's two prophecies that are going to be highlighted here in this portion of Scripture. One fulfilled, and the other was foreshadowed. In Daniel 9, 25 and 26, that was being fulfilled when Messiah would enter Jerusalem and then be cut off. Daniel's prophecy of 69 weeks, 7 weeks, and 62 weeks was coming to fruition right here. The Messiah, the prince, was coming into the city. And by the end of the week, and uh, we'll touch on this next time, but here the crowd is saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And I believe some of the same crowd was saying, crucify him by the end of the week. But here's God's timetable. And it's very important because in verse 41, Jesus is going to say, as we get there, he's going to say, if you only knew the day, he's not just talking about today I came in. This was a very special day. It was a detailed day. And here's how that works out. God's timetable here began with the commandment to rebuild Jerusalem. And that was given in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 5 through 18. That commandment was given on March 14th, 445 B.C. to that very day that he came in, and that was April 6th, 32 A.D. Now, this was the first time that Jesus permitted himself to be worshipped and recognized as Messiah the King, as he entered Jerusalem. Even though something different was going to happen, as I'll mention in a moment. But Daniel's prophecy was fulfilled that day. Literally, the 69 weeks of years to the day. Now, if you like the math, I'll calc it out for you real quick. One week equals seven years. 69 weeks of years was happening right that day. In uh, the Hebrew calendar, you have 360 days. Now, don't try and work this out. Just hear what I'm saying. (laughs) So one week equals seven years. 
Seven weeks plus 62 weeks equals 69 weeks of years. Now you take that 69 weeks of years times seven years per week times 360 days and you get 173,880 days from the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. Now, uh, were the Israelites to have a calculator and counting off days? But this prophecy was getting fulfilled. 69 weeks the prince was entering. And that's what Jesus is saying, if you only knew this day. If they knew that day, if they were able to see it and understand it by faith, they would recognize that Messiah is here. Now, the entrance of Jesus riding on a donkey's colt, that's Zechariah 9.9. 9. But that was a foreshadowing. This was not the victorious entrance of the Messiah and the Prince of Peace that's spoken of in Ezekiel 44, verses 2 and 3. That's yet to happen. This was God's way of fulfilling his purposes of redemption, his love to take away the sin of the world. The people were thinking otherwise. The people were celebrating as though it was the Feast of Tabernacles, actually. That's why they're putting palm branches out there and all. By the way, it's the wrong season of the year. And they're singing Baruch Habab Bashem Adonai, symbolizing the triumphant presence of Messiah to establish his kingdom. Even the disciples, after Jesus rise, raises from the dead, he, uh, they ask him in Acts 1, is this when you're going to restore the kingdom? They, they're all thinking. And if the disciples were on to the fact that it was 69 weeks being fulfilled when he came into the city, they're wondering, okay, well, the 70th week actually is the kingdom week. So is that what's happening, Lord? Of course, remember what he said. It's not for you to know the times of the season but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. That's our, that's our mandate now. Continue to be a witness of God's love. Verse 39. And some of the Pharisees in the multitude said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered and said, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. <laughs> now, the Pharisees, unfortunately, are always motivated there by jealousy. Jealous motives rule with these religious leaders. And Jesus basically is saying, even inanimate objects like a stone would be more responsive than the Pharisees to praise the presence of Messiah in their midst. <laughs> Amazing. Now, the truth of the matter is, one day, creation is going to rejoice. And creation will be restored one day, but right now, and, and for them as well as for us, Jesus came to redeem all mankind, Jews and Gentiles alike. So Jesus' comment here about the stones crying out is not hyperbole. In fact, the Holy Spirit tells us in Romans 8, Verses 19 through 21, let me read that. The anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. You see, creation was ready. But what about mankind? And Jesus' tears are going to flow here as we read verse 41. You know why? Because of unbelief. Earlier in his ministry, when he was at the tomb of Lazarus, he wept. People said, oh, he, how he loved Lazarus. I believe he was weeping over their unbelief. Again, Jesus weeps 
for unbelief. Verse 41, and when he approached, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known in this day, in this day, you see, if you had known in this day, the end of 69 weeks, Daniel's prophecy being fulfilled, if you had known in this day, then you would have recognized me. If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, the things which make for reconciliation, the things that make for redemption, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. You know, uh, that's kind of a sobering thought, isn't it? It's kind of like God is saying, all day long I'm holding my hands out to you. But you refuse. You refuse to come to me. I want to pour out my spirit on you. I want to make my words known to you. But you refuse. Well, now it's hidden from your eyes. Interesting. Interesting. You know, we always say God is a God of second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth chances. He is a merciful God. But he's saying here, you don't recognize the day that's been hidden from your eyes. Now, two of the disciples, I believe, Andrew and Philip, had their eyes open from the beginning after encountering Jesus. Right when Jesus was calling the disciples, right, in, right at the beginning in John chapter 1. Andrew first found uh, his own brother, Simon, that's Peter, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. All he needed was a couple hours with Jesus. And he knew who he was. And Philip, Philip found his friend Nathaniel and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Here's the one. See, Moses said, a prophet will arise like me. In other words, a human being, another person like Moses. And Peter, of course, a little bit later on in, uh, in, in the ministry, he also testified that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God. So although the disciples will have full realization after Pentecost, they were open and they were willing to find their peace in the Son of God. If you remember, uh, when uh, Jesus said, uh, eat my flesh, drink my blood, that was in uh, John chapter 6, a lot of his disciples turned away. They said, that's a hard statement. Who can, uh, who can hear that? Jesus said, the words I speak to you are spirit and life. But then he turns to the disciples and says, you guys want to leave too? And Peter says, uh, where are we going to go? You have the words of life. They were getting it, but at Pentecost, when they were empowered and filled with the Holy Spirit, they had full realization. Of course, that's for us now. So Jesus goes on to say to those who are spiritually blind standing there, verse 43 and 44 as we close, For the days shall come upon you when your enemies will throw up a bank before you and surround you and hem you in on every side and will level you to the ground and your children within you and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Boy, this was a prophetic ful fulfillment. Jesus was speaking uh, futuristically. 37 years later, the Roman uh, army came in, led by General Titus, and leveled Jerusalem. But Jesus is saying, you didn't recognize the time. Now, he's not saying, hey, it's uh, 11 o'clock. Do you know what time it is? He's, this word time is kairos. This is season. This season was three plus years, 
Jesus was here. Do you remember his first sermon he preached when he came in the power of the Spirit from, from uh, the wilderness temptation? He shares Isaiah uh, 61, the first two verses. And then he says, this scripture is fulfilled today in your presence. Man, they, they went bonkers. But this was right from the beginning. He was recognized that this was the season of Messiah. And then he says, you didn't recognize the time, the season of your visitation. Now in English, we figure uh, who's knocking at the door, right? Somebody's visiting. But this is a really powerful word. This is the word episcope. We get episcopos from this. We get elder. In other words, you didn't recognize the time of the overseer of your lives, of the elder and authority over you. Oh, they marveled. They marveled at the, uh, at the miracles, signs and wonders, but short-lived. They missed a very important day and moment in their redemptive history. Jesus came to preach good news, the good news of repentance. Oh, repentance, yikes. I got to say I'm sorry. Repentance is more than saying sorry. It's changing your mind. It's changing your, your emotions. It's changing your will. It's coming on in on line with the Lord, with God, and thinking God's way. We're new creatures, aren't we? The old is past, the new is here. Jesus came to preach the good news of repentance, the good news of reconciliation. Today, right now, it's just the same as then. He's saying to them, you got to get right with God. Brethren, you got to have a relationship with God, not just a religious system. Do you know God personally? And then he's saying, you need to treat your neighbor as yourself. You need to love that neighbor. That neighbor could be your spouse, your friend, your parents. You need to be in right relationship with everyone. I love this sign of the cross. The vertical relationship of you and God. The horizontal beam relationship with you and others. That's what he's saying. I'm preaching reconciliation. By the way, that's the ministry every born again believer has. The ministry of reconciliation. Getting people right with God and right with one another. What else is there? And then Jesus came not only to preach the good news of repentance and reconciliation, but also of redemption. Redeemed. Redeemed. The justification of a person. I like the little... The little rhyme that goes with it, justified, just as if I'd never sinned. That's what God wants to do. He wants to look at you and me just as if we'd never sinned. Well, how does that happen? There's no way I can make uh, you know all the right moves, uh, do the right things, say the right things. My justification or my redemption is in the Lord Jesus. You know, when you come to believe in Jesus, he's in your life. Paul said, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And when Christ is living in you and me, guess what? Our Father sees the Lord. Let's not let uh, old Louis get between the Father and the Lord. And you, you the same. In Luke 4.19... Jesus came to his hometown, as I said, in the power of the Spirit, right at the beginning of his ministry. And his message, which he was echoing Isaiah 61, the first four verses. 
But Jesus' message there was personal, personal freedom from bondages. Wow. Comfort for the distressed, healing for the afflicted, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. When he preached that back then, it wasn't, the favorable year was there because he was there. But when he came into Jerusalem, that was the right day. That was the right time. That was the right time for you and me and them to realize this is the Prince of Peace. This is Messiah. This day was the introduction and the invitation of God's favor upon all people. That's what it was. The writer of the book of Hebrews exhorted the people, and the Holy Spirit tells us there in Hebrews 3, 7 and 8, as well as chapter 4, verse 7. I put those together. God again fixes a certain day. It's called today. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. You know, so I have to ask, is today your today? <laughs> Every day is a good day for it to be today with God. Are you hearing his voice? Try, I hope you're hearing his voice and not mine. <laughs> I mean, you hear my voice, but I pray that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right where you are. Are you hearing his voice, sensing his prompting? When I say something like, you need to receive the gift of salvation, is there a tug in your heart? Jesus is inviting you to come, if that's the case. If you're sensing his presence, through some of these portions of scripture that we've read. And he's inviting you to come and to receive the gift of salvation. And if you're ready to receive, I'd like you to pray this prayer after me right now. Lord Jesus, thank you for drawing me to this moment. Thank you that you can even use a medium like live streaming to speak to me. Lord, I have done my best to try and serve you and know you. And yet you have said, I want a personal relationship with you. It's not about good works. It's about intimacy with me. And that's what God is saying. And I pray right now that I can receive your gift of salvation. You said if we ask, you will give. And we're grateful for that, Lord. So, Lord, right now I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I ask you to cleanse me of the things that have separated me from you. And I ask right now, Jesus, that you would come into my life. That you would be the Lord of my life that you would sustain me and keep me. I thank you, Jesus, that I can trust you. I thank you, Jesus, that what you have said is validated by your resurrection as we'll celebrate next week. Lord, you know my heart. Right now, I give it to you. I'm yours. In Jesus' name, amen. And I praise God if you prayed that prayer as sincere as you could be, uh, obviously, in your living room, wherever you are, you can trust if you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. He says in Romans chapter 10, you will be saved. and You won't be disappointed. And I praise God for that. If you're already saved, if you've already received the gift of salvation, then this is for you. Realize that your day of visitation is every day. <laughs> and recognize that his grace is within your reach. 
And I've done a little acrostic on the word reach, okay? You ready? R, release control of your life. Allow God to transform and free you every day. E, ease up on yourself. God will sanctify you. Quit trying to be holy. Quit trying to be a do-gooder. I mean, it's good to do good. But let God sanctify you. That means he'll make you holy. Holy. A, accept God's ways. What God begins by grace, he will finish. In Philippians 1.6, it says, He who began a good work in you. Those of you who prayed to receive Christ just a moment ago, he just began that good work in you. And he will bring it to completion. C, conform your spirit to his living words. Let his living words, Jesus said, the words I speak to you are spirit and life. Let his living words conform you. Hear what he's saying and walk in them. And H, there'll be a harvest. Harvest your daily growth, not to hoard it for yourself, to give it to someone else. Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. The Lord knows our time is now. Now more than ever, this pandemic, whatever it is, is humbling people. It's scaring people. The uncertainty. This is a good time to have both feet on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. And not to be unrealistic, but to have a message of hope. The hope that our belief in him is not just for this temporal life, but eternal. It's time for us to be more, more fully embraced in him and walk in his path. It's time to surrender the trappings of this world. Funny how we can't do the things that we're used to doing how our activities are limited. Our, I mean, I even resorted to watching this, the taped Super Bowl again because <laughs> I'm uh, wondering about football season. But these are trappings. They can be. They can be. We definitely are back to first things first the things that are really important. It's time to recognize that Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. He's the Messiah. He's the Prince of Peace. Are you recognizing this day of your visitation? Palm Sunday, a very special day. Today's April 5th. It was April 6th. A.D. 32, that Jesus came into Jerusalem. And uh, he came in because he was determined. Isaiah says he set his face like a flint to do the Father's will. And we'll continue that as we uh, continue the little bit on the Passion Week, and we'll talk about the resurrection next time. So if you bow your head with me, let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you again. Thank you that we could share together. We could remember you in communion. Uh, Lord, uh, that wasn't just a ritual. That was a testimony that our life is following your life in the flesh and that our spirit is alive to you in the spirit. And we're grateful that we could remember you this way. And thankful, Lord, that you fulfilled everything the Father wanted you to fulfill, that you endured. And I know that many today are needing that grace of endurance, endurance financially, health-wise, relationship-wise. Endurance in being limited in what we're able to do. 
And Lord, we're not arrogant. We're submissive people. And so we follow directions. But in the midst of it, Lord, I pray that we would find new opportunities in our fellowship, in our homes, in our marriages, that it would be sweet this time that you have set aside, that you have allowed to happen. And so we thank you, Lord. We do pray over your people, Israel. We do pray your hand of covering over Jerusalem, Lord, the apple of your eye. We pray, Lord, over our president and those who are working with him. We're grateful, Lord, that we live in this country. And so we pray, Lord, for mercy and healing and peace. In the name of Jesus, amen. Have a great day in the Lord. Yes.
The 